At the start of the dispute between the parties on the issue of fraud is the cognizable doctrine oft repeated in the cases that a claim of fraud will not arise when the only fraud charged relates to a charge of breach of contract. The assertion of this doctrine, however, is not dispositive, but is merely the threshold of analysis. The courts have struggled, not only in the fraud area, but with claims of negligence as well, to spell out the separate spheres for each when a breach of contract claim is also asserted. These borderline situations most often arise where the party's relationship initially is formed by contract, but there is a claim that the contract was performed negligently. The matter of the nature of the defect, the injury, the manner in which the injury occurred, and the damages sought persuade us that plaintiff's remedy lies in the enforcement of contract obligations, not the enlargement of strict products liability beyond its intended purposes. A more recent visit to the borderland was presented by New York University versus Continental Insurance Company, where a party has fraudulently induced the plaintiff to enter into a contract, it may be liable in tort. Where a party engages in conduct outside the contract, but intended to defend the contract, its extraneous conduct may support an independent tort claim. Conversely, where a party is merely seeking to enforce its bargain, a tort claim will not lie. In general, allegations that a party entered into a contract while lacking the intent to perform it are insufficient to support a fraud claim. The case at bar presents, among other misrepresentations, an allegation that plaintiff in negotiating the forbearance agreement had a preconceived and undisclosed intention not to honor it merely alleging that a party did not intend to meet its contractual obligation will not support a fraud claim. Yet, a promise made with a preconceived and undisclosed intent of not performing it has been held to constitute a misrepresentation. How can these pronouncements be reconciled? The distinction, it seems, lies in the cognizable difference between a representation of present fact in contrast to future intent. Stated otherwise, the distinction of the difference between a mere promissory statement of what will be done in the future versus the misrepresentation of a present fact, such as a promise made with the simultaneous intent of not performing it certainly means, while the misrepresentations related to something which was to occur in the future, we think the allegations in the complaint describe a case where a defendant has fraudulently and positively, as with personal knowledge, stated that something was to be done when he knew all the time it was not to be done, and that his rep representations were false. It is not a case of prophecy and prediction of something which it is merely hoped or expected will, bear, will occur in the future, but a specific affirmation of an arrangement under which something is to occur when the party making the affirmation knows perfectly well that no such thing is to occur. Finally, to survive an attack that a tort claim is but a breach of contract in other clothing, there must be a legal duty independent of the contract that has been violated. To maintain a claim of fraud in such a situation, a plaintiff must either, one, present 
probabilities and legal duties which operate from the duty to perform under the contract or to demonstrate a fraudulent misrepresentation collateral or extreme to the contract or three c patent damages that are caused by the misrepresentation and unrecoverable as contract damages helpful to the case at bar is the absence of any claim for damages for breach of the forbearance agreement. This was also the case in Sabo versus Delano Supra. In light of the foregoing dis discussion, defendant's pleading of fraud for damages and rescission suffice. They not only claim the misrepresentation of an intent to perform the performance agreement, but also a misrepresentation of the intent to allow M. Isserkorf and Amin to assist in collecting the accounts receivable. While the forbearance agreement required these defendants to use their best efforts to collect, it was silent as to uh, allowing them to do so. In that very tortured sense, plaintiffs alleged undertaking to allow them to do so is collateral to the contract. Even if that were insufficient to support the fraud and to, uh, counterclaims, it would undoubtedly suffice as an affirmative defense to the plaintiff's allegations that they defaulted in using their best efforts to collect. If a promisor himself is the cause of the failure of performance of a condition upon which his own liability depends, he cannot take advantage of the failure. Amos versus Westnuff, 255 New York, 156. 162, 174 Northeastern Reports, 436, 1931. Pretty good. What do we do? Yeah.